right now. The Bear County Medical Examiner confirming a toddler who died last weekend suffered a severe head injury while in the Hill Country. Gideon Barrado's death has been ruled a homicide. Dylan Collier traveling to Kerrville today and has more on a developing criminal investigation. Emergency personnel in Kerrville received a 911 call on August 6 for an unresponsive toddler at an area apartment complex. Two-year-old Gideon Barrado was then taken here to Peterson Regional Medical Center and then airlifted to a hospital in San Antonio where three days later he died. We are determined to uh, find out how Gideon sustained those injuries. Kerrville Police Sergeant Jonathan Lamb declined to elaborate on what those injuries were. But Barrado's cause of death was listed as a subdural hemorrhage or bleeding on the brain, which is typically caused by a significant head injury. Anytime a child uh, passes away, we uh, are determined to conduct a thorough and impartial investigation to find out exactly what happened. And that's no different in this case. No arrests have been made. Investigators, however, are questioning multiple people. We're interviewing everyone that we can speak to to determine again how Gideon sustained these injuries. In Kerrville, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. And Gideon would have turned three next Friday. A spokeswoman for Child Protective Services says Gideon's sibling has been placed with relatives. New at six, another first in the Bear County criminal justice system. A man accused of driving drunk goes on trial without a jury. He agreed to that. It's called a bench trial. Just the judge to hear the testimony and then return a verdict. And in this case, a guilty verdict. Paul Venema takes us through today's history making trial. This SAPD body cam video shows how 36-year-old Carlos Enriquez failed this field sobriety test. He was arrested for driving while intoxicated. What happened? Is this your car? Huh? You're out of gas? Okay. He told police that he'd run out of gas. As he approached with a gas can, he admitted he'd been driving the van. This was his third DWI arrest, making it a felony. During his trial, conducted using Zoom, prosecutors testified that Enrique's blood alcohol level was 0.16 at the time of his arrest. At a 0.16 at the time of testing, the defendant had to have been above a 0.08 at the time of driving. That's the legal limit. Enriquez told police that he was headed to his girlfriend's house when the van ran out of gas. His lawyer questioned whether Enriquez was even driving. This is all about operating was defendant driving the car while intoxicated? The answer, yes, according to the arresting officer. After those tests and the conclusion of my investigation, I believe that he was intoxicated when I put him in handcuffs. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Judge Pena will sentence Enriquez at a later date following completion of a pre-sentencing investigation. He's facing a punishment range of two to 20 years in prison. With the November election coming up and the COVID-19 pandemic dragging on, Bear County officials are looking into what can be done to make voting even easier and more convenient. But as Garrett Berger tells us, some in the community are urging the county to make sure they still take care of the traditional sites. The county's working on getting mega voting centers. They've got the AT&T Center nailed down already, as well as another location where people can spread out and stay socially distant. But we heard from some people today who want to make sure that's not the only option. Reading a statement from the League of Women Voters of the San Antonio area, one attorney from the Texas Civil Rights Project said mega vote centers would be a useful addition. However, adding the mega centers must not mean eliminating other vote centers, especially in low income and minority neighborhoods where voters rely largely on public transportation. His colleague from TCRP echoed that it shouldn't be an excuse to close any other sites. That would defeat the purpose of not having individuals all congregate in one location, and also many of them are not conveniently located. Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan says they won't start nailing down locations until the 25th because they still need to see what entities are going to be involved in the election. For example, the Lotus City Hall, if they are staying in the election, will be there. If they're not going to have their election, then we won't be there. And the mega vote centers aren't all nailed down either. Callanan says beyond the AT&T Center in Precinct 4, the county is set to use the Alcivar Shrine Auditorium in Precinct 3. But they're still looking for more mega vote center locations in Precincts 1 and 2. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. 
The push to expand mail-in voting as a way to prevent the spread of the coronavirus and keep voters safe, plus the controversy that has since followed that, was the subject of an episode of our online show, KSAT Explains. Mail-in voting has become partisan in so many ways. Opponents make the argument that voting by mail favors one party over the other or paves the way for voter fraud. Critics of those theories, though, say that's just a way to suppress the vote. We talked to members of both the Bear County Republican and Democratic parties to get their takes. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I don't want any illegal votes to count, and I don't want anybody to be taken advantage of because the same people that we're trying to protect from the COVID-19 are the same people that wind up being taken advantage of a lot of times in the absentee ballot world. It really should, it should not be because I really truly believe that it doesn't affect one party or the other. Um, but I do believe in these times that we're in, which are very uncertain, um, it is going to be beneficial to everyone, just for everyone's health and safety. You can watch the episode KSAT Explains Mail-In Voting on demand right now on the KSAT TV app or KSAT.com. Later on in this show, we'll tell you about the upcoming launch of the second season of KSAT Explains. The Bear County Sheriff's Department is honoring the life of Deputy Noah Calderon. His body was escorted from Corpus Christi to San Antonio today. He died during a collision with an 18-wheeler late Wednesday. His fiance also died and his brother is being treated at University Hospital. Noah's uncle says he became a deputy to follow in his father's footsteps. He wanted to, to serve his community, and which he did, he did proudly. And so we were so happy and grateful that, you know, he had, he had 20 years of life that we, you know, that we were able to experience that with him. Calderon is the youngest BCSO deputy to die. No arrests in a murder case going on eight years now, so investigators are hoping a new call for help will get some leads in who killed 34-year-old Santos Garcia. According to police, Garcia's body was found in the backseat of his burned pickup truck August 30th, 2012. The truck had been left near Springfield and Seal Roads on the east side and then set on fire. Information that leads to the arrest of the person or persons responsible could be worth up to $5,000 from Crime Stoppers. That number to call is 210-224-STOP. Turns out San Antonio police didn't have to look all that far for a suspect in a hit and run on the city's south side. He was already in jail on other charges. 36-year-old James Freeman charged with failure to stop and render aid. According to police, he was driving near West Poplar and North Sarsamora when he hit a woman crossing the street and then drove away. Investigators say a witness identified Freeman and they have surveillance video. The woman suffered hip and back injuries. Freeman was in jail on a parole violation in an unrelated case. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look at the TransGuide camera here at I-35 Loop 410 on the northeast side of town. No traffic tie-ups to tell you about in either direction or on the access roads. This is a scene we are very familiar with in this uh, work from home era these days. Look outside with live cam. Meanwhile, 103. We don't want to get familiar with that. Yeah, we're baking. <laughs> yeah, we are, right? 103, and actually we had a high temperature of 104, and that's a record for the day. The aquifer took another hit as a result of, of course, our dry weather pattern, the heat and nothing but sunshine, down almost half a foot again today. And the 10-day average at 657.1. It's important we look at that 10-day average because that dictates watering restrictions. Still stage one. And three allergens all on the low end today. Look at our highs. Del Rio, 107, that's a record. 106 Pleasanton and Carrizo Springs, along with New Braunfels and Gonzales, is 105 for the high temperature. Right now, 103 in San Antonio, nothing but sunshine. Luckily, not too humid, a dew point currently of 56. And it takes that drier air to get our temperatures this high. We had the dew points drop off this afternoon, and that's what boosted our temperatures up to the record levels. Clear sky this evening, warm and sticky. We'll still be in the lower 90s at 10 p.m. By 11 p.m. and midnight, finally dropping down into the 80s in this weekend. Very similar heat it will be anywhere from 100 to 105 across a good portion of South Texas and even slightly warmer in some pockets here and there. So over 100 through the weekend, some rain possible in parts of South Texas, even this weekend. So we'll talk about that and our expanded rain chances into next week and even not quite as hot next week. We trim back the temperatures a bit. All that coming right up.
People in Houston getting the opportunity to pay their respects to murdered Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen today. Her casket taken by horse-drawn carriage to the services held at her former high school today. The 20-year-old Guillen disappeared back in April. Her body wasn't found until the last day of June. Her case is inspiring new legislation in Congress that would let service members file sexual assault charges to a third party. The Guillen family will host a private funeral tomorrow on Saturday and Vanessa will be laid to rest at Forest Park in southeast Houston. We are just about to get to the daily briefing from city and county leaders on the status of coronavirus here in San Antonio and Bear County. We do want to report Bernie ISD has confirmed its very first case of COVID-19. Of course, back to school on the minds of so many right now. Uh, Bernie ISD started school in person learning on Wednesday. Here we are two days later with that first confirmed case at Champion High School. We don't know if it was a student or a staff member, but the district is saying that uh, those affected or those who have had contact with that person have been notified and people will be undergoing health screenings and quarantines as necessary. You can read all about that on our website right now. All right, let's get to the daily briefing. We're joined by Dr. Sandra Guerra, from our assistant city, excuse me, assistant director of San Antonio Metro Health. And we're also joined by Dr. Adriana Rocha Garcia, my colleague on the city council from District 4. This is our COVID-19 update from the San Antonio community. Tonight, we're reporting 150 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 43,823 in our community. Our moving day average now over the week has dropped to 213, and that's a very good thing. We want to keep that moving in the right direction. We are unfortunately reporting 18 new deaths tonight, and these deaths occurred between June 17th and August 12th, and these are fully verified and confirmed at this point, and that brings our total to 578 of our residents lost to COVID-19. Please keep their families and their loved ones in your thoughts and, and in your prayers. Tonight, we are also in the hospital, um, continuing to trend in the right direction. We have dropped now to 651 patients tonight in the hospital with COVID-19, 62 new admissions, as well as 306 in the, in the ICU, which is down five from yesterday. We're at 195 on ventilators, down 18 from yesterday. 55% of our ventilator capacity is available, as well as 16% of our hospital bed, uh, staffed hospital beds are available. Our hospital system remains under high stress, but it is showing signs of improvement. So remember that COVID-19 is still in our community and we must remain vigilant. So keep up the good work of wearing masks, physical distancing, washing hands, and we will get through this pandemic. Let me turn it over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And uh we have come a long way. Um, we were 1,267, which is our high mark in hospitals. That's back on July the 13th. So with the hard work that everybody's been doing, the masks, the uh, social distance, sanitation, don't get in big groups, within one month, within one month, we've almost put that in one half, from 1,267 down to 651. Also within in one month, we had 421 in ICU, we brought that down to 306. And we had in ventilators, we had 257 back then on July 13th, and we're down to 195. So a lot of good work in, uh, in the last uh, 30 days. Uh, we now have to continue that work uh, because we know that uh, we're shooting uh, for schools to open on September the 8th, and we want to have a, our community in a very safe condition before we do that. So let's keep up the hard work and uh, let's make sure we continue to do all the things that we need to do to protect ourselves as well as our uh, fellow citizens. Uh, I do have a new uh, uh, handkerchief, uh, double coated, uh, quadruple up here, and I also have this. So I want to thank uh, the census. You know, we're getting close on that, Mayor. Uh, this, they sent it to me today, by uh, Dwayne Robinson sent it to me. and. Um, we only have till uh, uh, September 30th uh, to complete the census. We'll be knocking on doors uh, to be sure and try to get you to sign up for it. Uh, you can also go online and, and, uh, and complete the census at 2020census.gov. Uh, so be sure and do that if you have the computer and the internet available in your home. Uh, and it only take you about 10 minutes to do it and get it done. Uh, be sure you have your date of birth of, of yourself as well as anybody else in your uh, household. 
And uh, we're pleased to say that um, the 26 uh, small cities of Bear County have uh, done a super job of getting the information out to um, all of their citizens. So let's keep it up. And I know the city of San Antonio has got a very aggressive program within the city, but we don't have much more time. So let's make sure we get the data in. It's going to count on how many major federal funds we get, how many congressmen we get is very, very important. Thank you. Important reminder. Thank you, Judge Wolf. And I do want to also make mention of something that we talked about a couple nights ago with regard to uh, the augmentation task forces. We get those from the state as well as the federal government. And so I want to clarify uh, in the Department of Defense, we do get a U.S. Army aug U.S. Army Urban Augmentation Medical Task Force, and we do have one still present. They're based in Fort Carson, Colorado, and they are here in San Antonio at this time assisting five hospitals. The DOD task forces that we've received are helping in other Texas cities as well with the concentration, of course, in the very hard-hit Rio Grande Valley. Uh, before we get into questions tonight, I do want to introduce my colleague on the city council who represents the southwest side, Dr. Adriana Rocha Garcia. Uh, we've talked a lot about how this coronavirus pandemic has taken a very real toll and a heavy toll in certain families. All right, Mayor Ron Nirenberg talking about federal help that we've been receiving here locally in combating COVID-19. Uh, some good news continuing in today's daily briefing. That seven day rolling average of the number of cases confirmed in a 24 hour period continues to go down 213 now. And both the mayor and the county judge saying that we are seeing signs of improvement. But we've got a long way to go. Uh, signs of improvement specifically in hospitals. We saw the number of people hospitalized dip below 700 yesterday for the first time in months. And now we are at 651 people hospitalized. All the numbers trending in the right direction, looking at where we were a month ago in July when it was really raging through our community. Uh, 150 new cases reported today, 18 new deaths, but uh, those date back to June 17 through August 12th. So those are confirmed and we now have a total of 578 total deaths through all of this. All right, the city continuing its investigation of deaths reported uh, by the state. Let's turn now to the weather out there. We got a hot weekend headed our way, Adam. <laughs> yeah, we do. It's going to be more of what we had today. So basically take what we had today and then extend it through the weekend with a little addition and that's a slight chance of rain and we'll jump into that in one moment. First, let's take a look at our temperatures. It's hot out there. Yes, we're feeling the heat. I mean, everywhere from the big picture to temperatures in and around Bear County and surrounding communities as well. Yeah, very hot. So there's that big picture. Holotus though, 105, Divine 107, Pleasanton 104, Bulverde at an even triple digits comfort. 103 in Bandera, 102. Del Rio, 106 right now. Again, it was a record-breaking day today here in San Antonio, Del Rio, even Austin as well. Nothing but sunshine here. At least the Panhandle's getting a little bit of rainfall. The upper-level high that's been in control of our weather, that's going to continue pushing its way to the northwest. And as it does so, it opens the door for little disturbances or ripples in the upper-level flow. So this northerly flow aloft, that's going to introduce some weak little disturbances in the days ahead, starting with, I think, parts of the hill country in Edwards Plateau Saturday evening. A lot of sunshine this weekend overall, don't get me wrong, but during the evening hours, as early as Saturday, notice we get to three, four o'clock, some clouds, and then maybe a few showers. Parts of the hill country will give it about a 10 to 20 percent chance Saturday for the hill country. Then into Sunday, we can't even rule out one or two getting a little bit closer to San Antonio. So over the weekend, hot. We're over 100, about 103 the high temperature Saturday and Sunday. There's that 10% in the hill country Saturday and a 20% late in the day and in the evening on Sunday. Then next week, even better chance of rain on Monday. I mean, it's not huge, but a 30 to 40% chance with a mixture of sun and clouds and temperatures reeling them in just a little bit in the upper 90s. You know what's hot out there when 96 is looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big cool down there. All right, uh, the NFL Cowboys all preparing for a season that may or may not happen. And Larry, they're uh, having their first practice. They are. And one thing they're doing up there to combat the heat is they're giving the Cowboys popsicles to help cool them down. Sounds pretty good to me, right? Dallas Cowboys held their first practice today. You'll notice a new look when it comes to the quarterbacks. Plus, speaking of quarterbacks, UTSA has four guys with FBS experience competing for QB1. Coming up.
I'm feeling uh, really great. Um, I've been taking it day by day and uh, just being out there with my guys is a great feeling. And of course, I'm ready to roll. Uh, been out for a very long time and it's just a blessing to be out there. UTSA quarterback Frank Harris says he's healthy and ready to compete for the starting job in big board sports. UTSA football is hard at work getting ready for the new season, and they have a unique situation at quarterback. They have four guys with FBS game experience in Frank Harris, Lowell Narcisse, Jordan Weeks, and New Mexico State transfer Josh Atkins. Harris started the first four games last season, then aggravated a right shoulder injury in week four versus North Texas, and he was done for the season. Narcisse played in 11 games and saw seven starts. JoJo Weeks played in three and started the season finale. Meanwhile, Atkins started 20 games for New Mexico State. All four are friends and pushing each other for QB1. Iron shop and iron, and uh, you know, we all go out there and compete. And, you know, we don't compete with each other, we compete with ourselves. And, you know, we like to build each other up. And if someone makes a good pass, you know, we let them know it's a good pass. And if somebody's is doing really uh, not bad, but, you know, make a bad pass, we try to go out there and encourage them to, to move on to the next play. And so if we go out there and compete, and, you know, the best man wins, and it's going to be no hard feelings. It's a joy to come and compete with those guys every single day. Iron does serve an iron, and um, and it, it's a lot of fun, and, and there's genuine relationships, and uh, we're honest when we say that. Week said the relationship between the quarterbacks is awesome. Yesterday, the Southland Conference postponed all fall sports. Soon after, Incarnate were did the same thing with the hopes of playing in the spring. Head football coach Eric Morris told us today he was approaching the season with three different models. One, starting on time. Two, a pushback date. And three, cancellation of the fall season. It's not the news they wanted to hear, but at least the Cardinals have some direction. We had three different models. Everything was up in the air, but finally, I think you know, as a program, our kids are relieved. Um, we're gonna get them in the weight room, train them the right way, and uh, ultimately, you know, here at UIW, we want to compete for conference championships and and then national championships. And so, um, you know, that that's what our goal is now. And so, I've been really impressed with the way our kids have handled this. Coach Morris is keeping the team together for voluntary practices and strength and conditioning sessions through the fall. Two full weeks after the Dallas Cowboys reported to Frisco for COVID testing, they held their first practice at training camp this morning and the first of the Mike McCarthy era. There were visible changes due to the coronavirus pandemic, but the one that really stood out has nothing to do with the virus at all. The quarterbacks are wearing red jerseys, a common practice at all levels to protect those guys. Plenty of new faces on the roster this season, including safety Ha Ha Clinton Dix, who played for the Bears last season. So what does he bring to the table? Leadership. Um, I like to take the ball away. Um, I, I mean, I, I've been in the league for seven years, never missed a snap, never missed a game. Um, you know, and, and I'm excited to be back here on this back end um, and uh, do my part. Dix has 16 career interceptions. Guys? I hope there's a season. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yes, Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. Back to school has been a huge topic over the last several weeks and months. We've talked a lot about what that will look like for high school, middle school, elementary school, less so at the college level. So for today's KSAT Q&A, we are joined by St. Mary's University President Dr. Tom Mangler. Doctor, thanks for being with us. We know that you have had students move back into the dorms over the last several weeks. Classes have resumed. So what steps has St. Mary's taken to try to limit the spread, try to keep students safe? Sure, Will. We've, we've been preparing for the beginning of the academic year like the other universities in town since, uh, since April. Uh, as I meant, as I, uh, Myra, you mentioned, we began classes on Tuesday. They're entirely online and virtual until September 1, and that's one of the precautions we're taking. That is, we're, 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 we're going slow. We're managing with uh, health and safety uppermost in our minds. Our students began to move into the residence halls about two weeks ago. We have a little bit over 625 students in the residence halls, which is only 50% of what we would normally have had last fall. And that's very deliberate as well. Our students are one to a room and no more than two to a bathroom. So we're, we're spreading them out. We're following all the protocols of social distancing. Uh, our enrollment, by the way, is uh, we're only a few percent back. We've got, had a very strong enrollment fall. And the best news of all is that we have no 
cases uh, reported to date since our students moved in. You asked about uh, what, what other precautions we're taking. Well, we we've, have uh, two residence halls actually that are vacant. And, we, and to the extent that we have any cases uh, uh, that develop or, or any exposures, we can move our students from a residence hall where there are other students into these more quarantine spaces. Uh, we have uh, uh, all the social distancing expectations about uh, six feet uh, apart. Uh, masks are required. In fact, all of our uh, community faculty, staff, and students have St. Mary's masks. And we have a mask squad. 80 of our student leaders have been trained to approach students and especially students and encourage them to wear masks and to uh, uh, support the protocols. And they have masks that they can hand out if someone forgets to bring a mask uh, to campus or leaves it in their residence hall. And, and the school also created a program kind of holding these uh, young adults to certain standards. You asked them to kind of sign a pledge and, and there's a new program that the school started. Talk about that. Yeah, we, uh, we gave some real consideration to how best to encourage our community to follow uh, best practices. And we landed on uh, what we call the St. Mary's Pledge. Uh, it's a pledge that we encourage all of our faculty, staff, and students to take. We're not requiring them to do so. We, we strongly encourage them to do so. They, it's on hard, hard uh, cardboard paper, and so they, uh, we encourage them to sign it and to post it in their offices or uh, if they're in residence halls on the door of the residence hall and their rooms to both remind themselves, but particularly to remind each other that we're all in this together and that uh, we will succeed in, in having a successful academic year and we'll succeed in, in protecting others in this community if we all follow best practices. I think implementing some of these procedures in schools is certainly going to be, you know, difficult. We're going to have to ask for a lot of flexibility uh, in the upcoming school year. And then at the college level, young adults, uh, they are just even more eager to be social and interact with each other. So what plans do you have in place for if and when there is a confirmed case on campus or in some of the residence halls? Well, we have a, a medical doctor, uh, part of our staff, and uh, he will he will work very closely with students to the extent that they're developing, showing any symptoms at all. We have tests that we will um, that we will administer, and if there's uh, and if those tests turn positive, then as I mentioned, we will uh, seek treatment, uh, provide treatment uh, for uh, and and in more serious case and and quarantine or isolate those with. COVID uh, and and to the extent that it becomes more serious, obviously we will refer our students, faculty and staff to uh, local hospitals. And then plans in place, I would assume for remote learning, should it become necessary to, to stop the in-person learning? Yes, we're, we're, we've provided as quite frankly, all of the other universities in town for a real flexible semester. As I mentioned, we're starting with online virtual till September 1. So that we can get a set, we we want to do that. We want to do this cautiously, and and hopefully after September one, we will be able to integrate up to forty percent of our classes as in person, a hybrid of in person and virtual. But we're prepared if uh, if there's a surge in San Antonio, for example, or if we have a, a a little bit of a surge on campus, to back off and to go entirely online and virtual. If should that situation present itself. We certainly hope it does, and we wish you all the luck in this new school year. Thanks so much for being with us. Tom Mingler, president of St. Mary's University, will continue this conversation coming up tonight at 10. Thank you. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The first season of KSAT Explains has wrapped up, and now we are planning for season two. This is, of course, our new digital show that you can find online and all of your streaming options that you <laughs> might find our KSAT TV app. Myra, one of the main people behind this, a good first season. Yeah, it actually, it, it really was. We had nine episodes, and if, if people aren't familiar with this show, um, like Tim said, it is on demand, it is online. These are 
uh, episodes where we take one single topic and we really dive into it. We try to give it context. So we have talked, of course, over the last several months, a lot about COVID-19 vaccination mm -hmm. trials that are underway here in San Antonio, um, how that has affected uh, our community locally here in, in different ways, different parts of San Antonio. We've even taken on topics like um, explaining coffee culture right. throughout town and how we have seen so many local coffee shops pop up and why is that? So. Uh, this is an episode, a show that is all about one issue that we really want to dive into, and we have more time to do that in this kind of a setting than we do in a traditional newscast. So it's, season two is coming. Yeah, up. it's kind of a deeper dive into the stories behind the headlines. Yes. And, and this week uh, it was the weather team really stepped up and we're talking about a somewhat controversial topic. Oh, but yeah. There's a lot of science behind that. And we're talking, of course, uh, climate change. Climate change. Climate change was episode nine, our final episode of season one. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey and Katie Blake took the reins on this episode, really explaining the science behind it. And also, we, I mean, we did address why is this such a hot button topic? How did this become so political? Yeah. Uh, and that's what I love about the show. We're able to really look at all the different facets of one single issue. So season two is coming up later next month. So all of the first nine episodes, just because season one is over, it's not going away. You can find all those episodes, watch them anytime on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app, which as Tim mentioned, you can find that any way that you stream. So look for season two later on next month. We'll look forward to it. Continued good work there with you and your team on KSAT thank Explains. You. Thank you, thank you. Let's check in with Adam. And it's all about the heat right now. We're still at 103 degrees. You see nothing but sunshine with that bit of summer haze over the Alamo City. All right, we did it today. We actually broke a record high temperature by one degree, we made it up to 104 after a morning low of 78. And of course our streak is still going. This marks the 23rd 100 degree day so far this year. This weekend we'll make it up to 25. There is a little bit of a shift in our weather pattern that's on the way. We're gonna talk about that and what it means for rain chances coming up. As millions of families already know or are finding out, working from home and parenting little ones at the same time, oh, it is challenging. Yes, so Fisher Price has a new line of toys for babies and toddlers who want to hang out near mom and dad while they work. It includes a play office complete with a toy laptop, pretend cell phone, and the all-important coffee cup. There's also a chef set, which has an apron bib and a chewable oven mitt. Got to be chewable, of course. <laughs> For the more fitness-minded kids, a baby bicep set has a play dumbbell headband and a pretend protein shake <laughs> drink cup. Also during the pandemic, Fisher Price and Mattel have announced action figures of doctors, nurses, grocery workers, and delivery drivers. I knew I was drinking too much coffee when my son <laughs> said every cup is coffee. <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> Air Jordans have never been cheap, even back in 1985, but these shoes worn by Hall of Famer Michael Jordan in an exhibition game that year just sold for a record price. The signed pair went for $615,000. That makes them the most expensive sneakers ever sold at auction. I had a pair that looked just like that. Jordan wore the shoes during an exhibition game played in Italy. An interesting little tidbit about these shoes is that the left one has a shard of glass in it. It lodged in there after Jordan dunked so hard he shattered the backboard. Just three months ago, a pair of Nike Air Jordans broke the world record for the most expensive shoes ever sold at auction. Fetching, get this, just over half a million dollars for somebody's old stinky <laughs> sneakers. <laughs> And that's how Gerber feels about it. <laughs> I do think the shard of glass thing is pretty That's pretty cool. neat. That's yeah. cool, that's right? Cool. I'll give Cassie, you that. Yeah, that is a agree? cool part to it. Okay. Yeah. It makes it a, a little bit more of a collector's item. Yeah, in my maybe opinion. not worth yeah. half a million dollars, but yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, got money to burn. I got to spend I, it on something, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I guess. Um, it's one way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, what a day today. Very hot out there, and we made it up to 104 here in San Antonio. That's a record high for the day. Del Rio 107 earlier today. That was a record. Austin Bergstrom Airport broke a record, and Pleasanton 106 for your high temperature along with Carrizo Springs. So we're feeling the heat out there. It's going to last all the way through the weekend. Take a look at the current readings at this hour. We're still 103. Luckily, not too humid, but here's the thing. 
When the dew points drop down into the 50s, like today, the air heats up more efficiently, and that's why we got up to 104. So it's a trade off. A drop in the humidity raises the temperature. <laughs> Rise in the humidity drops the temperature. It's just a trade off. And it all, what it basically all comes down to is what it feels like outside, whether there's humidity or not. So we're not in this alone, of course. Abilene's 107, along with Las Vegas. 105 El Paso, Del Rio 106 still. And right along the immediate coastline, we're in the 90s at this hour. Houston 94 and you get into Beeville 97 degrees. That's where we have the thicker humidity. So right there, it's perfect. Perfect example of this. Look, where you have the really high humidity right along the coast, dew points in the 70s, you have the air temperatures that are in the 90s. Locally, we have the dew points in the 50s and air temperatures above 100. So tomorrow morning, around sunrise will be well into the 70s with more noticeable humidity. That humidity surges back into place pretty quickly during the nighttime hours. Then by the afternoon, air temperatures popping back up to above 100. We're thinking Hondo up to 105, Rock Springs 101 along with Victoria, even closer to the coastline, Beeville included, about 100 degrees for the high temperature. So we're really cranking up the heat through this weekend. Lake Hills, Mico, Rio Medina, about 104. Castroville as well, Seguin, 104. You get the idea. We've got that heat and it's on. In turn, we have this heat advisory in effect until at least 7 p.m. on Saturday. I think it'll probably get extended through Sunday just because we don't really see a big change in this heat through the weekend. What this just means is, you know, we're going to be dealing with this high heat temperatures between 100 and 105, some places even slightly warmer. And at times we could see heat indices between 105 and 110. At least somebody's starting to get rain in Texas. That's the panhandle. The upper level high is starting to move out of our hair and push westward. In turn, they're getting into a bit of that northerly flow, a little impulse of energy now in the panhandle. And I, I would not be surprised if we get some leftovers of that activity as we get into the upcoming weekend. So let's talk about that. That upper level high plants itself over California and Nevada. The farther away it is from us, the better it is in terms of rain chances. That gives us this wind out of the north up above us. And within that will be embedded little bursts of energy and impulses. And it's difficult to time them out, but it does look like we could have our first little taste of it and a shot at some rain Saturday evening. By and large, this weekend sunny. You look at Saturday morning through the afternoon, nothing but sunshine. But then you get up into the hill country Saturday evening, look 6 p.m., maybe a few showers popping up, and then they dissipate as they head southward. We just can't rule out a few isolated stray showers this weekend, mainly in the hill country. But on Sunday, there is a little opportunity even closer to San Antonio. But the big headline this weekend, of course, is the heat back up to 103. It is another CPS peak energy demand day tomorrow. So reduce your usage between 3 and 7 p.m. Best thing you can do is not do laundry between 3 and 7 p.m. and just turn up the thermostat two degrees. We get into next week and we actually turn down the natural thermostat a few degrees back into the upper 90s with that slight chance of rain. Monday's our best shot right now, about a 30 to 40 percent chance. Feeling very Augusty out there. <laughs> Augusty, I like it. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. And here we go. Good morning. It is Friday, August 14th. Vanessa Guillen's memorial service will be held today in Houston at the same high school she attended. According to the family's attorney, the memorial will be at the Chavez High School starting at noon. The victim had a pretty significant injury but refused to go to the hospital. Police arrested one man but say a third person involved in the fight was not at the scene. The wife of the man in custody says her husband was taken in for a mental evaluation and has PTSD. She says they have ongoing issues with their neighbors. Dine in or take out and dig in. Culinaria has some big changes to San Antonio's celebration of local eats as the industry has suffered tremendously during COVID-19. We knew that restaurant weeks for August was more important than ever. So instead of two weeks, it's the full month of August. So it gives um, people a longer chance to explore those 
restaurants. New at five, a cold case murder arrest more than 13 years after a Universal City man was shot and killed inside his apartment. Laura Selders was taken into custody this afternoon on a capital murder charge in the death of 21 year old Blaze Wright. Wright was shot during a burglary at his apartment back in February 2007. The body of the Bear County Sheriff's deputy who was killed in a crash this week in South Texas was led by escort back to San Antonio today. The escort started in Sinton, not far from the site of the crash that killed Deputy Calderon and his fiance, Samantha Handy. The couple was hit by an 18-wheeler and died at the scene. Deputy Calderon's younger brother was also in the vehicle but was airlifted to University Hospital. We'll be stressing our power grid again tomorrow, so C it's another CPS Energy peak demand day. If you can, lower your usage from 3 to 7 p.m. One good thing to do is barbecue, cook outside instead of in the kitchen. All right, looking at temperatures. <laughs> Low 100s this weekend, maybe an isolated shower in the hill country tomorrow, and a slight chance later on Sunday evening. Next week, Monday's our best shot at 30%. I can hear my husband saying, Kasky said we shouldn't do laundry tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> at all.